are listening to the Experience 50 podcast for midlife. I'm your host, Mary Rogers. This is episode 204. Hey guys, how are you doing out there in this crazy COVID world? I know some of our states are loosening up, people are getting out. I am still in a very much shut down state, uh, Michigan. And I think we're all kind of looking for things that we can do to stay busy. And one of those things, this is sort of interesting, people are using this time to jump into DNA testing and genealogy. Apparently, the ancestry sites where you can reach out to people who you are related to have huge increases in activity right now. And you guys know from if you've listened for very long, I have a big DNA mystery of my own. And so I have also jumped in. Now, within this episode, we're going to be talking about DNA and genealogy and uncovering mysteries and how to get some help with that. At the time that I recorded this interview, I had put a pause in my own Oh, you know, my own quest to figure out who my grandfather was. So at the end of this episode, I at the end of the interview, I should say, I will give you an update on what I have discovered and who I've been in touch with. So before I tell you exactly who I'm interviewing, I do need to welcome some new patrons to my official Mary Rogers neighborhood over on Patreon. Want to say big thank you and welcome to Jenny Upton, Miriam Lockhart, and Marion Kremen. Thank you so much for supporting the Experience 50 podcast with a monthly contribution. If you would like to become a patron and get all the goodies that go along with it, just jump over to experience50.com forward slash donate. So here's what I'm doing today. I am interviewing a really cool woman. Her name is Mary Eberly. She is 56 years old. And I just love her because for one thing, she is an absolute pro when it comes to professional pivots. And five years ago, she made a whopper of a pivot. So what you're going to hear from her is these seemingly disjointed, nonsensical twists and turns in her career that ultimately came together in creating what is now just the most obvious and perfect business for her to pull together from these prior experiences. So what she does, Mary Eberly is the owner of DNA Hunter, helping people to combine the DNA testing that we can all enjoy now, along with the scientific genetic research that she is trained in, and then some good old-fashioned detective work to help people answer these mysteries that uncover themselves when we go through a testing process, such as 23andMe or Ancestry.com. There are several books and resources that are going to be mentioned during this interview, and rest assured, you don't need to write them down in the full show notes at experience50.com forward slash 204. I have included all of those links, and there is also a link there to get a free download from Mary Eberly, which is a DNA roadmap that will show you how you can be tested by just one company and then share those results with other testing services in case the people you're trying to track down didn't use the same test you did. It's very cool. So let's jump in. I'm really happy to have Mary Eberly with us today. 56 years old, multi-career pivot queen, and currently DNA Hunter. Welcome to the show, Mary Eberly. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mary. I really appreciate being here. Well, you're so you're you're an interesting person. These various jobs that you've held. Take my listener kind of through your career track. 
Well, I graduated from college in 1986, and I have a degree in biology. I then went to work in various research labs, and I was there for a decade. And the majority of the time in the lab, I was working on DNA and developing DNA tests. So that was DNA tests for people that needed bone marrow transplants, similar to what I'm working with today, but different. Then after being in the lab for 10 years, I was trying to decide I wanted to go back to graduate school or law school. And I, I chose law school and I graduated in 1999. And I knew at the time that I wanted to be a patent attorney so that I could apply that science background. And I did that for 13 years. And, um, and after that, I left to start my own business. The first business I started was actually a different one than DNA Hunters. Um, the first business lasted a couple of years, but then I started DNA Hunters in 2015. What, what was the first business attempt? <laughs> I'm interested to know. Sure, sure. It, um, so it was a business called First Step Renew, and I taught sustainability classes, and I founded a kid's summer camp <laughs> where we did gardening and we raised chickens and uh, we, we made ice cream from scratch, <laughs> all kinds of really fun outdoor things with kids. And then you started DNA Hunters. What a wild ride. So let me ask you something. What have you learned in each of those pivots that you took, including deciding that that first business wasn't going to be the business for you? Was it a sense of, you know, not being fulfilled or just being really curious and interested in, in going in a new direction? Like, in other words, were you responding to a negative or a positive charge? Mm -hmm. With the being in the lab for 10 years, I always loved the science. I always loved being in the lab. I was able to publish papers and present my work at scientific meetings. But without an advanced degree, I wasn't able to do, you know, to have my own lab or you're just limited. So at that point, I was looking for something new and something challenging. And I found a couple of people who were patent attorneys. And they were very happy with their lives. Um, you know, so I had these really great, you know, examples of people doing it and loving it. So I went for it. <laughs> I went to a school that in Milwaukee, actually, Marquette University Law School. You know, it was awesome. I, I loved law school. And I started practicing. And, um, you know, at first, it was great. But just after after 13 years, I, you know, decided this is not for me. Well, and it's that it's not for me anymore. Not right, that, exactly. boy, did I make a mistake for 13 years. Just, all right, I did that. Close the book, ready to do, well, or maybe not even closing the book, but taking those skills and experiences and knowledge and transitioning it to something else. And And what a cool thing that you were able to blend your first two careers into what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. It is really wonderful. I mean, the you know, summer I, camp and chickens, that one doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? What do you think that was? Um, I think the underlying basis is science and nature. And, you know, that's what I love. I love to garden. I I was raised on a farm. I just, like, I wanted to do that. And um, I guess the thing I learned there was, Financially, it wasn't sustainable. Like I, I just couldn't generate enough income with that business. Okay, so now, so then you started DNA Hunters, which what what an interesting world we live in now with DNA testing at the consumer level, um, so different than when you were first working within that area of science. I'm sure. Did you ever see this day coming? No, it actually, uh, it came because one night I was watching TV. It was the Finding Your Roots program on PBS. They do all this research and they present it to them in this big book. And that night they had on a DNA expert and she helped the host find his father's 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 father. You know, I just saw that finding that answer you know, to the question he had wondered his whole life was just so 
rewarding and so fulfilling. I didn't know that DNA had been combined with genealogy, but that show, you know, was what led me to this career. It, it's so interesting. And for listeners who haven't heard my little mystery story, I'll I'll share that right now with Mary. I have wondered, um, it, it's so interesting that you do this because I've been thinking there must be someone out there who knows how to <laughs> do the detective work behind genealogy and genetics. Because I do, I, I told you, I have a great big mystery. So my mother was raised by a gentleman who was the mayor of Detroit, governor of Michigan, went on to be U.S. Attorney General under FDR, and then a Supreme Court Justice, U.S. Supreme Court. And it was always a mystery to us if he was our grandfather or his brother was our grandfather. And officially, his brother had his name on the birth certificate for my mom. But it was well known that my grandmother, she got herself pregnant. And then this family with two brothers were told, there's a baby on the way. One of you has to marry me. And because... One of them had this very prominent career. He was just about, he was in the midst of the election to be the mayor of Detroit. The brother was put up as the father. And it was a written contract that you will be married for five years. Then there will be a divorce. The child will be raised in a convent. We, I mean, it was a contract. And Mm -hmm. so we always grew up just kind of wondering. And the uncle... Um, one one of the brothers died when my mom was younger than 10, the one who was technically her father. But his brother, who had really raised her, died when she was maybe 18. So they were never around, you know, when I was in the world. So it was only like a year and a half ago that I was traveling to the town that that family was from, that it's the Murphy family. And all of a sudden, I just got the weirdest sense that this this story doesn't really make any sense to me because there were a bunch of women in that family and they never scooped my mother up and made her a part of that side of her family. And women don't do that. And maybe it took me being this age before I understood that, that women would not let a young girl not know her family. And that's when it just dawned on me. They knew she wasn't blood. That would, that's the only answer. And so I took a DNA test. I found some of these relatives on um, that Murphy side And asked if they had taken tests, and they had. So I used the same company, and it came back, and sure enough, no connection. Wow. (laughs) It was real. So obviously, my grandmother got pregnant by someone else, and she blackmailed them. Mm. And she may Uh or may not have had sex with one of them, where I think they thought it was real. So I think she must have slept with one of them. And when I look at my DNA uh, results, there are so many people I am related to where I can't track them. You know, they, they're not related to my grandmother and they're not related to my grandparents on the other side. And so that's the, I have them all color coded. Mm-hmm. And so these are, this is the mystery gene pool. And compared to my cousins and other people who have gotten their results, I have an inordinate number of like third and fourth cousins. Okay. Which makes me think maybe my grandmother was impregnated by a gigolo type, or maybe there was someone, because this would have been like 1926. Maybe back then when a woman couldn't get pregnant, there was someone she could go to and say, I need I need a baby, impregnate mm-hmm. me. And maybe that's what she did, because there just 
so many of them. Okay. So that's my story. Uh huh. Uh huh. And I've chosen not to pursue it just because, for whatever reason. Do you want my, my sure. little bit of feedback? Yeah. Okay. And that is having a lot of cousins at a certain level could just be a reflection of the ethnicity of that missing person. And um, so for, for example, let's say the person who's missing or unknown was French Canadian. Well, there are so many French Canadians in the, in North America, um, many of whom have tested and therefore, if you have French Canadian heritage, you could have a lot more cousins than the average person. Another um, one is if you have really deep U.S. colonial roots, then you'll have way more matches than somebody, for example, with Eastern European heritage. Um, you know, they came into the country a lot later. They're just not not that many of them have tested. So I can almost look at somebody's number of matches and right away know, like, okay, they must have these really deep colonial roots because they've got 10 times as many matches as I do. And there, you know, there's some of that with the Irish. Like Irish tend to have a lot of those third and fourth cousins. And if you're uh, Ashkenazi Jewish, then you're going to have a, a bazillion cousins and um, and people are related on multiple lines, you know, so like, like you'll have a cousin and you'll say, oh, this is my third cousin on my mom's father's line. And they're also a third cousin on my father's father's line. And, you know, they're a third and a fourth cousin. And, you know, all of a sudden you're related to somebody a bazillion ways. Interesting. And that's that's true for the French Canadians also, you know, the. The French Canadians, the people that the Cajuns in Louisiana. Uh, I have a friend whose mother is Cajun, and she's got matches that she matches on twelve different lines. So, <laughs> you know, it's just because you've got that really small community that intermarried predominantly within their own community. Right. Well, that makes perfect sense, and and probably, I mean, for instance, Catholics. You know, lots and lots of kids. So the Irish would make sense. Right. So it something that I had learned that I thought was so interesting with, I mean, I have my own mystery. I've had another guest, Diane Dewey was on the show, and she's the author of Fixing the Fates. And it was so interesting in her story that the names on her birth certificate were not true, because she was adopted. I had no idea that adopted children had, you know, I mean, basically, it, genealogy is all about documentation. And yet it can just be wrong with adoptions or situations like mine, where where a, a, a woman giving birth, she can name whoever she wants to be on that birth certificate. Right. Right. We, you know, we think, oh, I finally found that birth certificate. I've been doing that research and now I know the answer. And yet, like you said, that's not the answer. You know, it's one piece of evidence to support your hypothesis that Mr. So-and-so was the father or Mrs. So-and-so was the mother. It's not the end all and be all. Right. Well, and I wonder, for instance, when I go on Ancestry, and I can see that there are so many family trees out there that have been created by distant relatives of my own who I don't know, that they are using the assumption of my mother's birth certificate being correct. And so they have bad information. And it's incorrect. And it leaves me thinking, should I be alerting these people that that's incorrect? Or what, when is, I mean, genealogically and historically, it's accurate, but not scientifically. How do, how do we wrap our heads around that and our obligation to correct 
the genealogical paper trail? I think it's up to each individual in terms of how you want your tree to look. Um, you know, we run into some sticky situations where we find out that someone's father isn't their father. And then, you know, they, they insert in their biological father and then, you know, somebody else sees that and they get really upset that, that their dad, you know, it's their dad, not her dad, put them, you know, put, put that man into her tree. And, um, you know, people have called ancestry to say, you know, I need you to take down that other person's tree. <laughs> And, um, you know, they're not going to do that because it's, you know, it's your tree and you can put into your tree what you want. And, you know, when I'm working with adoptees and other people with unknown parents, um, you know, we oftentimes keep trees private if they, you know, like in order to not upset the other family, you know, it just depends upon the family dynamics. Scientifically, it's estimated that about 2% of birth certificates and vital records list the wrong father. Only 2%? Well, it, it, it varies widely depending upon the culture and the point in history. Um, but, you know, if, if you're forced to come up with an average, then we say 2%. So it could be, you know, 10% down to 0.5%. Hmm. You know, it just... It, it depends. But when you start to think about your family tree, you know, once you get out so many generations where you're doubling your number of ancestors at every generation, you know, if you if you consider that two percent of that is wrong, and now everything, you know, beyond that person that you inserted incorrectly, like you were saying, the rest of it is wrong. Yeah. So We've got we've got a lot of um, trees out there that are incorrect. Absolutely, and for so for instance, in my case, because the name on the birth certificate is from a family of a famous person, there's great pride out there, you know, that people have that they are related to him, and they don't like that being taken away. Right. There's a, a lot of hostility about that. So when I, the people who have been, I think I have a second cousin who I've never heard of. And so, and I can see, by the way, I've color coded my um, mapping of the tree. You know, I've sent an email through uh, or a message through Ancestry and not gotten a response. And so for the average person, that's the dead end, you know, unless you want to hunt the person down. So is that what you do? I do a lot of um, tracking people who don't respond to those messages. You have a DNA match and you think like, oh, this is going to really help me with my mystery. And you send that message through Ancestry and the person may or may not respond. Oftentimes they don't. Well, and it occurs to me also, they may not have that email address anymore. They may not have their Ancestry account. It doesn't even necessarily mean that they have chosen to not respond. They may have never seen the message. Right, right. And actually, it's interesting, um, just as an aside, during this time we're in with the stay at home and shelter in place, uh, people are getting responses from people, you know, let's say they sent a message a year ago and, you know, the person never responded. And now that people are in their homes and they've got time on their hands, they are actually going online and seeing, oh my gosh, you know, I have 10 messages in my Ancestry account. So now is actually a really good time to go into your accounts to see if you have new messages. Oh, well, you know, I'm going to be doing that as soon as you and I get off the line. Because <laughs> I am curious. So it, what I've read about you is that you specialize in helping adopted people find their birth parents. And so is that sort of your the group, the niche that you've chosen for yourself? 
Or are you also helping birth parents look for children they gave up? Uh, I'm finding the parents of adoptees and other people with unknown parents. And that might be um, people where, for example, they just never knew who their birth father was. Um, Some people, they do a DNA test and they realize that the father that raised them wasn't their biological father. You know, so maybe they were donor conceived. A lot of times, especially in midlife, the parents aren't around to go to to say, you know, hey, mom, you know, what happened? How come I'm not matching any of dad's side of the family? So we're left with DNA and using that to find those missing parents or grandparents, like in your case, um, or even great grandparents and, and further back. I'm having people test at Ancestry or 23andMe or Family Tree DNA. Um, we, we also have My Heritage. And sometimes people need to test at multiple places because you just don't know where your matches are, you know, which of those four companies they've tested at. And there's all there. I know I've seen services where you can upload your raw data that you receive from one of those services, and it it goes into a much larger um, clearinghouse of that data. Do you recommend that people do that or do multiple DNA tests? I recommend that they transfer. So we are able to transfer from certain companies into other companies. There's also GEDmatch. It's it's spelled G-E-D-match.com. And that is a website. They don't do their own DNA testing, but they, they pull together results from other companies. I think that people should be aware when they're testing at these companies and when they're transferring into them that now we have law enforcement using these databases to identify criminal suspects and victims. And if they're not comfortable with that, then there are ways to set your account so that law enforcement can't go into your result. And really, it's it's that law enforcement who are working with genetic genealogies like myself, they are submitting a sample into these companies or that database and they're seeing who matches that sample. You know, so it's not like the police are going into the computer and like looking at all of your DNA. It's just they'll get the matches to you if you have agreed to that, the same way that your cousin's going to match you. Right. Well, I also know, for instance, we have um I have a friend who He is very curious to do his DNA test, however, has chosen not to do it. He's in his early 50s, and he slept with a lot of women before he married his wife. And he just doesn't want to know if he's got kids out there. I mean, no one ever contacted him and said, I'm pregnant. But apparently he was a busy boy in his 20s. (laughs) And he thinks, yep. I just, it's not a good idea for me to do that. Right. Well, the thing is that um, he does not need to be in that database in order for someone like me to figure out <laughs> that he's the father. <laughs> well, so, expl- so so explain that. Okay. Um, well, one example is one of the very first cases I work, a woman who is an adoptee, she figured out who, who her birth mother was, and she still was wondering who her birth father was. And she did DNA testing. I looked at all the matches. I built out their trees. And when you build these trees, you're looking for who are the common ancestors to this group of cousins. And I'm also building the trees forward in time to figure out, well, who of their descendants were in the right place at the right time you know, the right gender. So in this case, if we are looking for a birth father, like um, for this person, and in her case, he was the only son of a couple. So I didn't, I didn't need to decide like, well, it looks like one of these brothers, there's only one George Jr. He has no siblings, it's got to be him. You know, he died in the 1970s. 
So he never tested. You know, we did this in 2015. You know, it, the fact was that enough of his cousins had tested that we could figure out from the trees who he was. Exactly. Well, that's very much like my situation. I know that my grandfather certainly never had a DNA test. So it's looking for that person's offspring and then their cousins. And that's the way eventually I would figure out right. who it is. Right. But it's not going to be a name on a computer screen. It's going to be probably speaking to two cousins and asking them questions. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes asking questions and then oftentimes asking the descendants to test. Got it. You've been doing this for how many years now? For just over five years. Okay. So you've been doing this for just over five years. Tell me a story. <laughs> uh, a woman came to me. She did DNA testing. Her father had passed away when she was eight. And she had always asked her, her mom, you know, well, tell me about my dad. And her mom said he was of Spanish descent. So she looked at her DNA results and the ethnicity estimates, and she had virtually 0% Spanish heritage. Her mom had passed away at this point. So she, uh, she tested at another company and same thing. And in addition to that information that she got from the ethnicity estimate, she also had a, a set of cousins that she could not fit into her tree. So the companies say like, well, this person is about your second cousin, or this person is about your third or fourth. And actually, it's, it's not as clear cut as that. Because when she asked me to look at the results, I realized that these cousins were very close. I, I, basically, I had to tell her that her dad wasn't her dad, which was like probably the furthest thing from her mind. You know, she just wanted to know, look, well, how do these cousins come into my tree? Um, in that case, there were, boy, like eight brothers. And she told me they're from South Carolina. Like my family's never been in South Carolina. Um, you know, she was thinking maybe her grandfather or great grandfather or, you know, like some rascal up there must have been in South Carolina. So I looked through the eight brothers and I, I knew who her mother was. I thought, OK, has this brother been anywhere besides South Carolina? You know, no. You know, th these these people, except for one, one had been in uh, he retired in Florida and then I'm you know, you know, going through the list, through the list, and I, I came to the point where I thought, okay, her mom was born in this year. You know, all the rest of the brothers were born after that, so they would have been younger. But, you know, I need to keep on going. And I got, I got to the very last brother, and he was in the military in California. And her parents lived in California. I, you know, I realized, like, I bet... I bet you <laughs> it's got to be this youngest brother. And he had passed away, but he had children living. So I called her to give her the news, you know, that it was the big, you know, dropping the bomb on somebody. And luckily, this brother or potential half brother uh, was willing to test. When she called him, he said, Oh my gosh, I always knew I had a half sister out there. Like, I don't even need to test, but he did. And sure enough, he was her half brother sharing their father. And um, she actually wrote a short memoir about this called the magician's daughter and her name, I, you know, and normally I protect the uh, identities of my clients, but because she wrote this book, uh, her name is Lucinda Davis. And she, she wrote and self-published this very sweet and fascinating memoir about this giant surprise. And uh, it's available on Amazon as an ebook. <laughs> so it's, I highly recommend it. So that was, she was completely unprepared to find out that her father wasn't her father. And then to find out there was, you know, a half brother out there and a new father. 
was she happy? Was she confused? I mean, how was she when you had to be the one to deliver that information to her? She, she was quite shocked, you know, she was shocked, right? She wasn't ready for that. You know, people think, well, ancestry said that he's really my, you know, this level of cousin. So how could it be that they're really closer? And how, you know, how could you have all of those how could questions? How could my mother have done this? And now the people are gone because she was probably in her early 60s when she discovered this. Okay. So we're, I guess we're kind of familiar with hearing those stories from people who find out that their their family tree is much different than they expected it would be. But I haven't really heard many people in your position share what that's like. So what I'd like to know is when you begin working with a client, do you communicate to them, you may get surprises you don't expect? And what's that like for you? I do communicate that. And a lot of my clients are looking for their birth parents or their birth father. So they know it, but there still can be twists and turns. Uh, For example, I had someone the other day whose parents were very closely related. (laughs) And, you know, I'm not trained in psychology or counseling or any, you know, any thing like that. Okay, wait, be, well, fess up. When you say that these two people were very closely related, what are we saying? It was brother, sister. Okay. So her parents were brother and sister. Right. This person's. Okay. Right. Who? Oh. Yes. How'd that go? On top of that, the person had been left outside the hospital. It's not super uncommon, you know, in the old days, And up until very recently in my state of Wisconsin, it was illegal to abandon a baby. So if you were at the hospital and you decided there's no way I can raise this child, I'm just taking off, you know, you could be arrested and prosecuted for abandoning a child. And what a lot of women do is they instead they will leave the baby in a place where it will be found. She was left outside the hospital, on the sidewalk, by the nursing school. The mom probably sat in the car and watched to make sure somebody picked up the baby. And, you know, that is a really, that's a lot lot of information to deal with. People in that situation are so relieved to know, you know, where they came from. You know, he knew he was a foundling, which is what we call people who are found. You know, he had all of the newspaper articles and, um, but still had these questions like, how did this happen? And who would have done this? But in the end, they are very understanding and very forgiving. Um, I've I've heard another person who does this, this work say that foundlings are the most forgiving people of all. I I do know of someone who was adopted, and he had grown up being told the story that I believe it was that his mother worked in a delivery ward, and that there was a a child who was going to be put up for adoption. And so one of the nurses said, Oh, I'll, you know, that that one's mine. (laughs) I'll take this baby. And the man who I know was it just never felt right to him. Just for whatever reason, intuitively, he had abandonment issues. And he he attributed that to the fact that his birth mother didn't want him. But he, he just had this gut-gut feeling that something in his story didn't match up. And so after his adoptive parents died... He went back to their little hometown, and he went to the library and had the librarian help him. And turns out, even the librarian remembered the story that he was found in a trash dumpster. Oh. And after several days, this, who turned out to be his parents, stepped up and said, we will absolutely raise this child. He was right. Isn't I mean, it, that's just crazy to me. 
Right. I, I know I've heard of other people, you know, just like knowing, you know, knowing that the father that raised them wasn't their biological father and just always feeling that tension. And when they ultimately found their biological father, feeling that connection to him. Mm-hmm. And, and I have one client like that, that she said, you know, okay, well, now things make sense. She met her biological father, whom I found. He was in hospice and he had stage three or four prostate cancer. And she went to the hospital to meet him and they were able to meet several times. And then he passed away three months to the day that she met him. She said, you know, he said things that my parents should have said to me. Oh, wow. Just and just, that, just that words connection. of love and support that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. What happens when, it, or I should say, has it happened that you find people who do not want to be found? I have one experience with that. It was a half brother. He, the funny thing is, he also is an attorney. And all my client wanted was some health information. And he responded, but made it very clear that this was a ridiculous statement, you know, that, that his father could have fathered another person prior to his marriage. But then he was kind enough to say, okay, here are the answers to the questions for the medical history. And then the last paragraph was the, you know, basically leave us alone paragraph. So that is, that is hard to accept. You know, the client said that she had read the book by Danny Shapiro called Inheritance. And that in that book, it gave her a similar story. I haven't personally read the book, but she said it really helped to have read that book. Well, not everybody wants to know who's out there. And, and I, I do have a, I, I would say it's an acquaintance, but someone who they're an attorney and basically what they do is the cease and desist letters, you know, to keep people away from fathers who, and I guess what he, what he's working with more are um, sperm donors who just don't want to know. They're not willing to give medical information and they just keep referring anyone who contacts them to their attorney who follows up because when you, when you're a sperm donor, it can be hundreds of people. Right. Right. And I have had people approach me who've wanted to find their donor. And I always tell them that in general, sperm donors do not want interaction. Yeah. Because of what you said. Yeah. And, you know, many of them did it when they were young, they needed the money. They, you know, and then they typically they went through med school, they married and they have their own family and they may or may not have told their family and they just do not want anything to do with their donor conceived children. Yeah. So that's, that's a really tough one. Well, it's, I, I, this had never occurred to me, but I saw, oh, this was maybe six months ago when I, I was reading about, I I didn't know that sperm banks are ethically supposed to not reintroduce that sperm into one community. And the re, I didn't, I never thought about this. You can, if you're in through a fertility clinic, getting a bunch of people pregnant using the sperm from a, small number of donors, everybody ends up being related to everybody else. And and you find then <laughs> people are falling in love with their half brother or half sister a, a generation down. And it's very, very dangerous. I never didn't know. Right. And in other developed countries, there are strict limitations on the number of live births from one donor. Um, and whereas here, This is a highly unregulated industry that, so therefore, you know, we don't have those limits. You know, they're not written into the law. 
And if you have a popular donor and you're the clinic, you just, sh- you know, keep on shipping. Yeah. It's so disturbing. Mean, and the stories that I read about really were like kids on the playground finding out for one reason or another that they were related or teenagers who were dating each other and found out, oh, my gosh, we share the same father. Well, I, I would like to add that that happened and happens in the natural world. So, <laughs> uh, so I had one client who um, realized she had gone to high school with her half brother. You know, so we have th- those situations happening without the donations going on, without the yeah, without a in sperm, vitro. yeah, without a <laughs> test tube or any of that. Yeah, this and, and it used to be that these things would happen. And no one knew otherwise. It's now these DNA tests <laughs> that are making the difference. So if someone wants to work with you, what I'm I'm just curious to know, how do you how do you work with clients? How do you charge for this when you really don't know this could be a quick, easy job or it could be not? an easy job. How do, could, I, I'm just curious to know the prices and um, give people an idea of what your services are and how much you charge. Sure. Well, you're exactly right that it's hard to know at the beginning how much time something can take or something will take. So I have been recently starting out with a small research package, and that is five hours the cost of that is 625 and that is for for me to get in there and to start doing the work um, looking at the matches looking at the trees of the matches i also give a lot of weight to the ethnicity estimates and i i want to be able to tell someone that it's worth your investment to go forward with the research um the larger package for going forward with it is a six month contract. And that is $2,500. And I know there, the competitors just have the one, you know, giant package and they'll charge it to you, you know, whether it takes two hours or 50 hours. And I just feel like it's much more fair to my clients to say, you know, let me get my hands in there and let you know if I advise you to move forward. And, you know, I think the risk there is that someone is thinking, oh, geez, you know, you're going to charge me $625 and just to say whether or not you can do it. But at the same time, you know, it's like, well, or I could just charge you the full amount and then... (laughs) It turns out I can't do it. (laughs) Well, but also in some cases, five hours of research, you will solve their mystery. Right. Right. I mean, that, and and in some cases, I bet it is pretty simple, not simple, but I mean, you could come to the conclusion quickly. You just never Mm -hmm. know. It's a roll of a dice. So I think what you do sounds much more fair for people. And, you know, I suppose for someone, it's how much sleep are you losing over not having the answer to this question? And and like in my situation, I have friends and, you know, cousins and such. They're like, I can't believe you aren't diving into this to figure it out. And, you know, my grandmother was a psychopath. And I don't know if I care. You know, my mom was still raised by the people who raised her. You know, that is the truth. And the fact that um, they got swindled by my grandmother, um, I think it it's really stinky <laughs> that she did that. I'm just so glad my mother never knew. Oh, this is another thing. When I, when I did my test, because I wanted to find out about my lying grandmother, I did say to my sister before I got the results... I said, I have to let you know, I have a suspicion. And when I get the test back, 
do you want to know if I find out that we really don't know who our grandfather is? Because if you don't want to know, I will paint a look on my face that says, nope, there, that's our grandfather. Absolutely. And and I, I really wanted to know before I knew the answer, did the rest of my family want to know the truth if it wasn't the truth they wanted? I think that's really important, you know, to ask people ahead of time, you know, once you know the answer and you go back and you say, hey, do you want to know the truth? Then they know what you found. And that comes into play also when we're asking people to test. For example, I've tested my own DNA. And recently, I asked some cousins to test. And I said to them, if something unusual comes up, do you want to know? And it's really important to say that before they spit (laughs) into the tube and you send it off. (laughs) Because you never know what you're going to find. And, yeah. um, you know, if they, you might end up being the keeper of the secret. And, you know, if, if they're doing you a favor by spitting in that tube, then I think you owe it to them to be upfront about these secrets that might come out, uh, to be upfront about law enforcement, because a lot of people are really okay with law enforcement looking at our genealogical databases, but there are people who do not want the cops looking at their DNA, uh, you know, to put it in their language. Yeah. Um, so, you know, just to be upfront uh, the, about those, the pros of this and the cons of it yeah. and how do you want to manage it? Right. And, and I don't think that all family secrets are bad. <laughs> it's not the truth. But sometimes if this is something that happened generations before us, you know, does it matter? You know, we we can know, but I don't know that we have to go, you know, barking up other people's family trees and telling them there's a a false piece of information. Right. And they, you know, they may or may not care. Well, it's like going to a woman and telling her her husband is cheating. You know, she may damn well know it, but didn't want anyone to know that she knows. Mm -hmm. We (laughs) We don't all want to be held accountable to the truth. Right. And so I think I think that's what we you know, there are a lot of people out there that, you know, it's like the truth is the truth is the truth. And we all have to be real. And we all have to look at the black and white of exactly the truth. And I respect someone's, you know, in, in a situation like this, they don't have to have their face, you know, pushed into it. So, all right. What are, what would you say to people who have a mystery? Um, are there any other considerations that you would have people think about before they hire someone like yourself to start sniffing out the trail? One thing I would say is that my favorite place to test is Ancestry. And that's because they have the largest database of people who've tested. They also have the most family trees attached to those DNA results. And they have some really good tools like those color coding tools that you had mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, You do have to pay a membership fee if you want full, you know, the, the full ability to analyze your test results. Um, So, you know, there are pros and cons with everything, and that's the con with Ancestry. And um, like you mentioned, you can take those results from Ancestry and transfer them to other places. And that account will always be there with Ancestry. You just won't, it's not that you lose access to your information, but you lose access to all the tools that go along with it. Right, right. If you subscribe or if you just do your DNA test and then you decide now now is not the time to look into this. I'm going to wait until fall or winter and um, the information will be there. <laughs> yeah, I, I know it's a lot of money to, to subscribe to Ancestry, but um, 
almost every single mystery I have solved has been solved at Ancestry. Oh, really? You know, sometimes it's in combination with other companies where I'm seeing, you know, we've got the set of matches at Ancestry and it looks like, okay, it's probably this Scottish family in Nova Scotia. Um, but then there will be other people who've tested only over at 23 and me. And so that's like another piece of the puzzle. And then the same thing for family tree DNA and my heritage. Um, you know, we're, sometimes I need all of those pieces of the puzzle to solve the mystery. Yeah. Yep. Is there any other story that you would like to share before we bring this to a close of working with a specific client? There was a quick one this week mm -hmm. where a friend of a friend uh, had done testing at 23andMe. So he tested there and in his match list is a half brother. And very quickly, I was able to figure out it was a half brother through their fathers. And then the question is, well, which father was it his father or my father? who is both of our fathers. <laughs> well, yeah. Oh, I wouldn't so, even think about that. That's interesting. Right, because one of their fathers has to be both of their fathers. So it would also be if they're directly linked to their mothers. And if one of their mothers doesn't match, then you, well, no, that wouldn't necessarily, oh, see, you start going deeper and deeper in this. Yeah. Yeah. 23 and Me is interesting. They give you your maternal haplogroup, which means like the type of DNA you got from your mom on your mitochondrial DNA. So only mothers give the mitochondrial DNA to their children. And all of their children will have the same mitochondrial haplogroup. And these two men had different. So I knew they didn't share a mother. You know, plus it's, it's harder to share a mother, but not your father. You know, just like someone just doesn't plop into your match list. And, you know, it's like, oh, you're, you know, typically it's not your mom that had that extra baby. Um, it's typically your dad. So, in, and in this case, because they tested at 23 and me. They got the, also their Y DNA haplogroup, and that's their paternal haplogroup, which is their father's 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 line. And I could see that they had the same exact paternal haplogroup. I'm so glad you told this story because this is where your background working in genetic science pays off that you understand because it's not just some numbers. There, there are the different numbers mean things for what way you're tracking their lineage that you, you know how to look for that. Right. Right. Well, that's very, well, and I had heard someone told me that men are able to learn, to learn more about their ancestry than women are something about our DNA being different from men's. What, 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 what am I thinking? Men and women both have mitochondrial DNA. So they we all have mitochondrial haplogroups. We all have autosomal DNA, which is the vast majority of our DNA. But then men also have this Y DNA haplogroup. And that gets inherited from their father, who got it from their father, who got it from their father, and so on. And that is extra. DNA that women don't have because instead we have, we actually have two X's. So those are the sex chromosomes, the Y chromosome and the X chromosome. So you and I have two X chromosomes as women and men have one X and one Y. And that Y DNA can go back really far in time and we can figure out in a lot of situations where their direct paternal ancestors were 5,000 
or 10,000 or 70,000 years ago. So if I go back to that example about the TV show, the DNA expert used the host's Y DNA to find out that his Y DNA type was a European type. And the host is Dr. Henry Louis Gates, an African American professor from Harvard. And a lot of African Americans have European DNA from the slavery because women were raped and babies were made. You know, so he learned that his father's father's father, I don't remember exactly how far back, Mm -hmm. um, was probably the slave owner and the owner of his ancestor. DNA testing has meant so much for the African-American community who could only go back so far. And I I have heard stories from uh, people who, like when they were growing, people our age, that when they were growing up and they were in school doing the darn family tree project in third grade, and Black people just, they, they could only go back you know, like two generations, and then it was a bunch of question marks of who the heck knows. And it was very embarrassing for them growing up and not having, not being able, you know, say, and then we came on the Mayflower, you know, they were like, I have no idea what country I came from. Or kids were told, everyone bring a dish from the country that your ancestors came from. And they'd be like, we don't know. It could, right. It could be Jamaica. It could, who knows where in Africa. And so I think this this is a beautiful thing in that situation, even though things like what you just said are showing up of the plantation owners and masters. and ugh. Right. I can, right. It's, it's a huge breakthrough. And if I could share one more story. Please do. I love the stories. I worked with a client. Uh, She was born in Vietnam to a Vietnamese woman and an African-American Vietnam soldier. She was adopted by a family in England and raised in England. um, And she always wanted to know who her parents were, the biological parents. It was a very, very difficult case because, like you said, In general, before the Civil War, there were no records. People, there are no records of African Americans. They were at best enumerated on the census as a number and their age. Uh, We we have wills sometimes that will say, I'm leaving these slaves to my daughter and these slaves to my son. You know, very few records. You know, I worked on that case and worked on that case. And, you know, it was, I built all these trees and I was trying to figure out, you know, who is her father. One day in her match list, this really close match showed up. And it was her half first cousins. They shared their grandfather. You know, even at that point, it took us another month to find her father. It was just amazing because so many African Americans. And so many Vietnam vets are deceased. Mm -hmm. You know, the vast majority of Vietnam vets are gone. And here he is in a nursing home in North Carolina. (laughs) And she and her son flew from England to meet him in person. And the BBC came along. Wow. So she had this wonderful cousin. She has this wonderful cousin in the Twin Cities who was like my co-researcher and um, you know, that cousin got to go out to North Carolina. They all met, you know, they have been Skyping, but just to, you know, to touch your own flesh. um, It's just something that can't, you know, I'll never understand because I'm not an adoptee, but I've just heard so many stories. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, and let me ask you this, because it seems like as you were saying, um, it's it's more common for us not to know who the father is than the mother. It just that's just the way it is. 
But it, what I'm hearing from people is that the surprise on the mother's side that happens is that they, their mother is actually their grandmother. Right. And it was a yes. sister, an older sister who got pregnant and their mother made it look like that was another f- sibling. Right. Right. I have one of those in my family. Oh, do you? Mm-hmm. So e- it would either be like an older sister stepping up and saying they are the mother or the grandmother saying they're a mother. So people are finding out that their aunts are actually their mothers. So it's that DNA is still all, you know, we keep it in the family <laughs> when a woman <laughs> yeah. changes the truth. It we typically it we're naming someone else in the family tree, which that must be kind of confusing on your end when that DNA where it's just a matter of the leaf is wrong, not the branch. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what you're doing is very cool. Tell me what you find so satisfying about this work. What's really satisfying is finding those answers that my clients have had. Sometimes it's for decades. Sometimes it's over generations where their parent was an adoptee and now their parent is gone. But now with DNA testing, we can figure out the answers to those mysteries. And it it brings them this sense of closure and peace of mind. And some people have said, it's like there was always this piece of me that was missing. And now I have that piece. Working with people and helping them solve their mysteries is incredibly rewarding. And I just, I've never had that in any other career. And it's just so wonderful. Awesome. Interesting. All right. Thank you so much, Mary Eberly. DNA Hunters. How do people find you? At DNAHunters.com. Excellent. And if you do work with Mary, let her know that you heard her here on Experience 50 podcast. Thanks so much, Mary. Oh, thank you, Mary. I really appreciate it. Sure. It was fun. I want to thank my guest, Mary Eberly. You can get the link to Mary's download of the DNA Roadmap at experience50.com forward slash 204, along with all the links to things that were mentioned within this episode. And hey, you know what? If you need some help with this, check Mary out. I I, I can tell you from my own experience that, uh, you know, sometimes these tests just lead to questions, not answers, just a whole lot of questions. So as an update to my DNA mystery, I can tell you that I spent quite a bit of time on Ancestry creating this color-coded system of who made sense to me, which you know line they were from, and then there's this whole group of mystery people. So I have reached out to the mystery people through Ancestry, and they're not responding to me, even though I made my pitch for information very juicy and interesting, they have not replied. Well, what I did is I went back into these family trees of people I was connected to, and there was one woman who had the same last name, and she was part of this large group of people I don't know. And it turns out she is she has a a family tree that includes over 2,000 people. This woman is really into this. And so I even though she was a much more distant relative than the ones I've reached out to. She had that same last name. And so I sent her a juicy message, and she replied to me a few days later, and it was very obvious she did not want to share information. She made it very clear to me that Her family certainly could not be any part of my mystery. What I suspect, in fact, I'm pretty sure, is that her father-in-law is probably my grandfather, Uh, but she didn't want to go there. And so that's kind of 
the end of the story. And now I need to pay to renew my Ancestry.com membership if I want to dig in and find out exactly who that man is. So as you know, I'm not in a big hot hurry to do this, but I'm sure I'm going to do it within the next month. So I'm one step closer to figuring out who my grandfather is. All righty. I would love to uh, meet you in our next Zoom meeting with patrons, which is coming up in about a week or so. So if you have not already, be sure to join. It's a growing, fabulous group of people. My raving fans and I adore them. Jump to experience50.com forward slash donate. Love to you all. Do what you got to do to get through this crazy time, be it genealogy or learning to draw or learning a new language. Take advantage of this time because before you know it, it's going to be gone, I hope, and you can at least look back and have something to show for it. All right, kids, have a great week. I'll be back next Friday. You've got this. Bye. If you enjoyed listening to this episode of the Experience 50 podcast for midlife, subscribe in the podcast player of your choice. You can connect with me on Twitter at E50podcast, on Facebook, I'm Experience 50, or my private Facebook group, Experience 50 Midlife Community. I'll send you surprises and delights when you sign up for my free midlife community at experience50.com forward slash email. The fun really happens on my listener-supported Patreon page, where I offer bonus content at experience50.com forward slash donate. Do you have a story of your Experience 50 moment when life as you knew it changed? Email me at mary at experience50.com. Thanks again for listening and spreading the word to your friends. You've got this. 